Welcome to the Fix Your Sciatica podcast, where we meet with experts and clients and discuss how to manage your sciatica and low back pain without the use of medications or surgery. I'm your host, Dr. Ashley Mack, and I'm a physical therapist as well as the founder of iFixYourSciatica.com, a go-to resource for pain management. There's been a ton of buzz about the concept of inflammation and how it impacts our health. But I think one of the big challenges is that we don't have a quite, uh, we don't have a very good understanding, us as normal people have a very good understanding of what inflammation is and how it can actually impact our life. Better yet, how foods can actually influence our body's ability to manage inflammation. So on today's episode, I have our nutrition specialist, Sara Supani, who's going to talk uh, talk to us all about it. So Sara, thank you so much for hopping on today. How yeah. are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing really well, and I'm very excited to talk about inflammation. I know that there's a lot of misconceptions about it, what it is, how to prevent it, uh, what what the real hype is about it. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Yes, awesome. So with inflammation or with in, what when, when it comes to health in general, there's a bunch of people who are going gluten free, paleo, keto. A lot of these things are trying to address the big piece of inflammation. Now, as a physical therapist and pain management specialist, there's a big impact that it, inflammation has on pain. The more inflamed that we are, the more inflammation that we have, the more sensitive we are to our pain. And there is a big role in regards to food and what we do on a daily basis and its impact on inflammation itself. So, Sara, could you tell us a little bit more about, from your perspective, what is inflammation and, yeah, what is inflammation? How does it, how does it affect us? Sure. So, inflammation in general is the body's natural healing mechanism, and it is a vital part of the immune system. So, we need it in order to repair damaged tissue, fight infections, but there's a difference between inflammation that follows an injury or infection and chronic inflammation. So I think that's where the misconception lies is chronic inflammation is when your body is in this low grade, constant state of inflammation, and it's your body essentially attacking itself, which then leads to autoimmune diseases down the road. So the World Health Organization has even come out and said that chronic inflammatory diseases are the most significant cause of death in the world and ranks them as the greatest threat to human health. So we know that fighting infections and repairing damaged cells is a cause of inflammation but there's also been research that links obesity to markers of inflammation, meaning excess fat cells can also contribute to it as can chronic stress. So as much as I want to say that inflammation is a normal response, there are also outside factors that can trigger it as an unhealthy way. So it's kind of like if you have too much of one thing, even if it's going to be healthy for you, it can be way or more beyond of what you can actually tolerate. And manage. Exactly. That's a great way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. For sure. And here at fxercyanica.com, what we actually focus on is helping adults deal with chronic pain and the aspect of chronic pain. And I've spoken about it in our internal Facebook group where we discuss the aspect of chronic pain is when you're experiencing pain for longer than 12 weeks. And during the 12 week healing process, you are going through a stage of inflammation, which is going to be necessary to facilitate healing, where you're going to have increased blood flow. And with that increased blood flow, you're going to have swelling. When you have swelling, that's actually going to irritate the nerves, resulting in more pain. But when you have this inflammation for a longer period of time, it actually heightens your body's awareness in regards to the pain and the signals that you're having. So as much as you said that it is a normal part of the healing process, a normal process of living, having too much inflammation is going to be detrimental uh, to our healing and our health. Uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the aspect of, of, of what cortisol is, because when they talk about inflammation and stress and pain, we often hear this word called cortisol. And what exactly is cortisol? Uh, cortisol actually is, in, is a hormone that's released by our uh, adrenals, uh, which facilitates our fight or flight system, which means that our hearts, heart rates get elevated. Um, we start using our body's energy and really you are ready to either fight the imaginary or real threat in front of you uh, or to run away from that. And having that cortisol is important to allow you to do those necessary activities. But when you have elevated cortisol levels for a longer period of time, that in itself is going to facilitate longer term inflammation, which would then result in these autoimmune issues and these other health issues as well. Now, Sara, your background and what you help clients with 
really well, um, and we have some amazing client testimonials, is the aspect of being able to manage food and inflammation and using food as a way to heal the body and to enrich the body and improve the wellness. So tell us a little bit more about how food can influence inflammation, particularly like what types of foods can actually increase inflammation. Right. So broadly speaking, foods that cause inflammation are typically like refined sugars. So anytime you're reading a list of ingredients and you see added sugar in a food, refined carbs. So if you think like white bread, white pasta, white rice, where you're milling away the oat and bran and you're just left with this end product, trans fats, um, processed meats. So the more processed the food is, the more you're introducing foreign substances into your body that it's going to want to attack. And for some people, gluten and cow's milk dairy can also exacerbate it. So you almost want to think about it like foods that promote high acidity in the body are likely causing inflammation. So let's talk about processing real quick. Uh, we, we live in a, an amazing day and age where there's such amazing technology. And in essence, the evolution of processed foods was an opportunity for us as a society to be able to create foods at a faster pace, create more foods, and then also create foods uh, at, a, at a lower cost, um, which is great from just like an economical and scale standpoint. But the aspect of processed foods can actually facilitate a lot of, uh, say, health problems. And that processing where you're getting just the energy itself can cause a lot more of uh, that processing piece. Um, I'm just... Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say another aspect to it too is sometimes you're oxidizing it. So you get a lot of free radicals and those can also promote inflammation. So it's not even necessarily taking away the good stuff. It's also chemically altering the substance, like what the food actually was. So now like something that was a good product ends up being more of just like doing more damage to your body. So what's an example of a we'll say like an unprocessed food and then the like processed version of it? Uh, I think you voiced some um, description uh, before, but tell us, give us a couple of examples. You know, even something as small as like chicken, right? Like that's, that should be a good source of protein. But then if you fry the chicken, you're at, you're oxidizing it and you're adding these free radicals to it that wouldn't necessarily have been there before. So like a grilled version of that would be better for you. Um, I even think just in terms of like red meat, getting the, uh, like the grass fed, um, organic version of it, it tends to have more omega threes in that than omega sixes. So omega sixes cause inflammation, omega threes help heal inflammation. So that's another way to think about it too. So we're looking at both just how something is being cooked or prepared. So processing right. in essence means the transition from one state to another. So if we're taking, say, like a piece of chicken and converting it into, say, like a chicken tender, a chicken finger that's deep fried and battered right. and maybe even mashed up, there are multiple stages that this chicken has gone through before it actually goes into your mouth and consumed. And so in addition to that, in addition to the various different states that these this chicken has to go through, we then look at the quality of the the way the food is prepared so even if you are eating a type of protein how it's prepared how it's raised also has an impact in regards to the inflammatory properties exactly and and another example would even just be like cereals right so you're taking you're adding sugar to it you're refining it so i mean even that would be a, an example of something that's highly processed speaking of cereals what is your favorite cereal I don't actually eat cereal, <laughs> but growing up, it used to be Oreo O's. So, you know, I, I've come a long way. <laughs> I don't eat cereal that much either. Back when I was growing up, one of my favorite things used to be Frosted Flakes, which was just laden with sugar, but it was so delicious. But now as I've gotten older, I realized that I couldn't tolerate it as well. The next point of inflammation from a food standpoint, we, we covered processing, we covered quality. Another interesting piece that you brought up was the aspect of uh, acidity. So tell me, tell us a little bit more about that, that um, when it comes to how we can deal with inflammation or like, what are some high acidic foods that we could be avoiding to improve our health? Right. So I think like dairy, um, gluten, 
we, I think all these highly processed foods end up putting your body into a state of acidity. So when you think about neutralizing foods or alkaline foods, you're thinking more vegetables, you're thinking more like whole fruits, whole grains, things like that. Another component, um, just to manage inflammation in general, is keeping your blood sugar levels stable. And so you can do this by adding more fiber into your diet. So more dark leafy greens, the whole grains, the fruits that I mentioned, also increasing your intake of omega-3 fatty acids will help kind of balance the acidity, fight the inflammation. And these are found in fatty fish, but also in things like walnuts, almonds, flax seeds, and chia seeds. And I, a third thing I think that would be helpful is opting for unsaturated fats versus saturated fats. So saturated fats definitely promote uh, a high acidity. Unsaturated fats are found in things like um, more nuts and seeds and foods that are rich in omega-3s, but also if you look at cooking oils like avocado oil, olive oil, um, saturated fats tend to be linked more to animal sources. So red meat, butter, and a good rule of thumb is if the fat is solid at room temperature, then it's typically high in saturated fat. So you bring up an interesting point about a lot of these good unprocessed food sources are coming from say plants, not to say that eating animal products is a bad thing, but you can get a lot of your intake from the consumption of vegetables. Now, my wife and I, Katie, uh, we started eating a little bit more on the plant forward uh, eating spectrum. Um, ultimately the biggest driving factor for us was the fact that we got tired of having to eat chicken every single Tuesday of every week. And for us, when we transitioned to being a little bit more of a vegetable forward, it challenged us from a menu standpoint. Now our men menus are going to be a lot more diverse, but I noticed that I've actually felt so much better. Um, not to say that I never really ate too many vegetables. I eat vegetables at every single meal, but having a big focus on plant-based foods actually allowed me to feel a lot better when it comes to my digestion, uh, my joints, and overall like my skin energy levels. And then not to say that I never eat meat, actually we'll probably eat meat once or twice a week or maybe once every couple of weeks. And it actually has led me to uh, enjoying these meat sources a lot more and makes it a lot more exciting. And it's cool to hear and have it confirmed that getting a lot of your nutrients from these unprocessed vegetables, dark leafy greens and nuts uh, can have a huge impact on your health. They just tend to be more nutrient dense foods. Um, and I think a lot of people focus a lot on macronutrients and do I have X amount of protein and X amount of carbs, but there's also the impact of uh, micronutrients and vitamins and minerals because that ultimately is what's feeding your cells and feeding your body. So um, I think that's why I, I place a bigger emphasis on the vegetables, the fruits, the whole grains, um, because I think just looking at macronutrients and am I having energy levels is just one side of it. For sure. And I, I'll be honest, when I was uh, getting myself ready for my wedding, I did about six months of just counting my macros specifically, and I lost a ton of weight, but I started gravitating towards foods that I can just sneak in because it fit within my numbers, not particularly the healthy ones. And, um, and for sure, I could definitely have I could definitely feel the difference. And now I'm focusing more so on like, yeah, more micro uh, nutrient rich foods and it definitely has a huge impact in regards to how I feel. So for the audience out there, I think it gets, uh, it's a little challenging for people because there's so much information that's out there. Talk to, talk to us about a couple of the, some foods that can decrease inflammation and make us feel really awesome. I know that you listed a couple before, but yeah, let's, let's yeah. take a deep dive into that. You know, I think if you really focus on your fiber intake and just including more of the fiber, like the, the whole grains, the vegetables, you want to have about 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. So anything, any food that was is high fiber, I would say would be a good source. Also just stabilizing your blood sugar is a good way um, of just like cutting down on added sugars and looking for alternatives. So if you're somebody who's into sweeteners, try honey as a good source. Or if you're somebody who really wants to satisfy a sweet tooth, try like 75% dark chocolate or a little bit of that. Um, and then the last thing I would say is to really try to stick to unprocessed whole foods. So choosing whole wheat bread or quinoa or wild rice, even instead of like the white rice alternatives or white bread alternatives. So just the more ingredients that food has, the more it's been messed with, essentially. So just sticking to foods in their most basic form, what I, I would say would be the 
the most straightforward advice. Right on. And when it comes to, okay, so those are the foods themselves. Uh, let's talk about preparations. So, I mean, we could, we can go and eat a vegetable and it's most in the processed state, which is raw straight from the vine. I'm saying vine because I love tomatoes. One of my favorite foods. Yeah. But, uh, let's talk about like the things that are going to be the highest from like, a we'll say the least processed cooking preparation technique to like the most processed cooking preparation technique. Um, let's talk about the best ones. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I like to eat a lot of salads. So the raw food is really great, but I know that some people just, it doesn't have enough flavor for them. I think where people kind of like miss out on is using spices to add flavor, using garlic, using onions. It doesn't always just have to be these like processed powders or processed spices that you see. Um, so yeah, if you're wanting to like steam or even cook or grill some vegetables, just throwing a bunch of spices on there. They also have a lot of added health benefits that I think we're finding like turmeric being anti-inflammatory, cumin also being linked to in, um, anti-inflammatory diets. So I think as much as you want to prepare things, just using basic ingredients to prepare the food is the best way to go about it. I love the fact that you brought up the concept of using spices. Uh, I laugh about, um, sometimes I think about, I laugh about the food that we eat because we, my, my wife and I, we love such big flavors. And because we put a lot of spice in it, we put a lot of chilies, we put a lot of turmeric and all these other amazing things that uh, boost the flavor of our dishes. And I have definitely had people who come into our house pre pandemic, obviously, um, that they would come over and they would, they would not come back because they said our food was too spicy. Um, and that was just <laughs> really, that was a very funny thing that made me chuckle. And it just made me think like everything that I eat, I often add an extra spice to it because I love right. that flavor. And it's very, very comforting and exciting to hear that all these spices can have a huge impact, not only on flavor, but also on our health too. So right. Someone who, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, even like switching it out to for like olive oil to sesame oil, that adds so much depth to a dish. So little things like that can really go a long way. You don't necessarily have to think like, oh, because I'm being healthy, I have to eat this bland, gross food and force myself. Like there's definitely ways to experiment with it and have a lot of fun and, and not compromise its quality. So what you're saying is that it's possible to eat really healthy and unprocessed while also having it be enjoyable and not boring and having, so you're thinking, oh, I have to eat this boring piece of broccoli. Exactly. And I think the more people just go out and discover the different spices that there are, the more they experiment and try cooking on their own. Um, you know, I think they'll be pleasantly surprised at how fun it actually is and how satisfying it actually is. Over this pandemic, my wife and I, we've been focusing on, I mean, we have a pretty good repertoire of cooking, but we started turning towards other cookbooks. And it's exciting to see that a lot of these like top chefs are using these spices, which integrates into such amazing flavor. So again, awesome about the aspects of spices. You know, one thing with working with clients too, I've noticed is when they start to uh, shift their palate or start to eat healthier, they no longer crave like those really unhealthy, greasy foods. And it just doesn't even taste good to them anymore. So there is science behind it. Obviously your microbiome is changing. And so you're wanting, you're, you're craving the better foods because of that, but also your, you know, your palate is changing. And so you're able to think like a certain flavor that was once like really bold and it had to be in order for you to think it was good. It just starts to taste really like it, like, fake and and people just like steer away from that after a while yeah it's kind of like those cravings your cravings will dictate the drive to the foods that you eat uh yeah. you brought up the concept of the gut microbiome which can be an entirely different episode that we can that we will talk about because that's yeah. such an amazing subject and it's a fat impact on health just the gut itself but for those people who are listening they're probably thinking all right you know i i okay after listening to this, I realize I'm eating a lot of unprocessed foods. I got to get my act together. And Sara says that there, you can eat healthy foods and unprocessed foods in a delicious way. 
the, another question that people have is like, how long is it going to take? Like if I've been eating these inflammatory foods all my life, like how quickly should I, like, should I be able to expect to feel some sort of difference? Because it's a little different from a nutrition standpoint to, uh, as compared to say, um, say like exercise or even working with us from a back pain movements, uh, standpoint, because we can impact how you feel pretty quickly just based on a couple of movements. It's a little different from a timing perspective when it comes to nutrition. So if you are following, you've been eating a little bit more inflammatory and you make this shift, what are we looking at from a length of time before we start to feel a little bit of something? So I think it depends on how strictly you're modifying your diet, but I would say you can definitely start to see changes after around 12 weeks. Um, and based off of how intense your inflammation was prior to that, some people start to feel the difference after just a couple of weeks. So it's, it doesn't take as long as you would expect. Like I know that I've, I had some serious gut issues in, in my past and I just did an elimination diet. And after three months, I felt like I had turned the entire thing around. Like your body wants to heal. You just have to help it. <laughs> And a lot of people who are dealing with long-term inflammation or long-term pain, it's impacting every aspect of their life. And, and with many of the clients that we work with, it's hard. They, they usually start, it starts off with them having a hard time trying to see and feel what progress is. So if someone were to be chronically inflamed or be have, going through chronic inflammation, uh, what are some signs or symptoms, what are some things that they would feel knowing that they are heading in the right direction away from that inflammatory end of the spectrum? Right. So there's, I don't know if people get this feeling a lot, but it, it almost feels like a really sharp, like you're so hungry feeling. And that's not necessarily hunger. That's inflammation. It's like this high acidic feeling in your gut. So when you just realize, you know, like you're eating normally, you're eating healthily, you're eating a, an appropriate amount of food and not feeling like so starved all the time. That's a good sign. Also people who struggle with heartburn, acid reflux, um, GERD, all of those, all of those problems, you'll start to see those kind of diminish. Would clear skin be also another noticeable thing that people would experience if inflammation were to go down? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I know clients who have experienced clear skin after changing their diet around a lot. Clear skin, just um, better sleep. Honestly, there's, there's a lot of signs. There's a lot of subtle improvements. Right on. So when it comes to making any sort of changes, whether it be to your movement, to your eating, to your stress relief, if we are dealing with something, say, when it comes to say, dealing with inflammation, we're trying to from, from a coaching standpoint, we're trying to look at the entire picture, not just one specific metric. And we encourage our clients to actually look upon themselves and see what are you experiencing? Uh, what are, what is, if we're looking at from an inflammatory, I mean, we talked a lot about uh, action steps and things to do, but if we were to, to sum everything up, because there's a lot of information out there, if there were three things where someone can take from today's podcast and say, okay, I'm going to do this and I will not feel overwhelmed and be able to do this consistently. What are three easy, easy action steps that they can do to reduce their inflammation with food? The first one I would say is, I mean, you have to get that fiber in. So if you can increase your intake of vegetables to even just two to three servings on a daily basis, um, just making sure you're getting two to three servings in, um, she could be a pretty straightforward action step. The next one is maybe just trying to even like cook a meal at home uh, like on a daily basis, just to cut out some of that processed food, just so you know what you're actually cooking with and to really help change your microbiome around. And the other one is making sure you're stabilizing your blood sugar. So cutting out any added sugars that you're seeing wherever you can would be really helpful too. Well, let's go back to that first action step. I think eating vegetables is really key. Um, Interesting enough, it turns out that we as, as, a, as a society aren't eating as many vegetables as we should. So tell us a little bit more about what a serving size actually is. I think there's a lot of confusion in regards to serving sizes or a serving and what that consists of. Right. So if you did a little like fist, that would be one serving of vegetables. So if you want to get like two to three fists of vegetables in, that would be a good way to, to measure your serving size. 
Okay. So are you expecting people to grab a fistful of vegetables and throw it on their plate? <laughs> no, I mean, I think you can eyeball it. Like once you kind of get a good vision of what it looks like, you're able to eyeball it. I would say also, if you want to make like half of your plate vegetables and then the rest can be, you know, a serving size of protein, a serving size of carbohydrates or grains, um, if you will, that is also another good measure. So just take looking at your plate and saying half of that is going to be vegetables. And even putting your vegetables on your plate first is a, is a fun like exercise. I, I've had clients do and they're like, oh, I'm eating more just by putting it on first. One thing I love about vegetables is the aspect of you have to chew it a lot. And one of the things that I love about eating is the act of chewing things. So mm -hmm. when I switched to adding more vegetables, being a little bit more plant focused, I noticed that I was chewing for a longer period of time and chewing is just supremely satisfying to me. So following that there's, rule. There's is also, I mean, there's also a science behind that too. It, um, there's an enzyme that you have that's actually in your mouth that helps break down food. So it's easier on your digestive system. And it also chewing also activates a hormone, your hunger hormone. So you'll feel fuller sooner if you just sit and chew longer. So, I mean, 20, 25 to 30 bites is a good rule of thumb, but you know, you don't have to sit there and count it out. Just it's like, it's a good measure. Very cool. Uh, cooking at home during the pandemic, a lot of people were probably cooking at home. Uh, as things start to open up in society, it is important to still be able to cook at home because you know that you have a hundred percent knowledge in regards to what you're putting in those dishes and on your plates. And if you take these tips and guidelines that Sarah has put out in today's episode, you are going to be in a much faster way to relieving your inflammation, uh, which is going to be really, really great. And then stabilizing blood sugar. Blood sugar is going to be important. If you stabilize your blood sugar, you're also going to experience a lot less sugar spikes and sugar crashes. So your energy will be nice and consistent throughout this entire process. So those are three very, very solid steps to impacting your food and its role in inflammation. And Sara, I'm so excited for you to be able to share this information with us. It was really helpful. And for you listeners out there, um, if you are interested in hearing a little bit more about how nutrition can impact your health and your chronic pain, send us an email at info at ifixyoursciatica.com. We'd love to speak with you. And Sara, thank you so much for uh, coming in. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you got some help from today's podcast. And for more info, check us out at ifixyoursciatica.com. Have a fantastic and pain-free day. No patient-therapist relationship is formed by listening to this podcast. We are not providing medical advice, and all information should be confirmed by a medical provider.